Do you believe that we serve the God who can produce growth where there was loss in your life? Do you believe we serve the God who can redeem the pain in your life? Do you believe we serve, we happen to be worshiping and singing to a God who redeems your pain and gives purpose to your circumstance? Do you believe that? going to church, trying to be the perfect son. My family was almost the perfect family from the outside looking in. Then the day came. My parents fought like they normally do, but instead of the normal door slamming followed by apologies, this time they decided to get a divorce. It was a long and bitter divorce, and they both pulled me into the middle of it. I was so angry. The anger kept growing for the next two years. Then my father, being in the military, received orders to Heidelberg, Germany. So during the summer, before my ninth grade year, we moved to Germany. What an experience. But it was a culture shock. I started hanging out in downtown Heidelberg, Germany, with some friends. We were about 15 years old when we started going to bars. I was frequently drunk on school nights and on the weekends. I was drowning my anger in alcohol. The bars that I went to had one thing in common. They were biker bars. We made a lot of German friends and just followed the bikers we knew to the bars they went to. I was young, mad, and running from the Lord. This went on for three straight years. This is when I found a heart for the biker culture. It is so interesting how the Lord can turn the sin in my life into something for His glory. This is why I'm so comfortable in talking with bikers now. I have a history, a past with them. I did many things, but at a very young age. The Lord used my past and this love for biker culture to do something I never thought was possible. The Lord put it on my heart to start a biker ministry. But I was hesitant. I was scared and I didn't want to be in charge. I had no idea how to lead anything of that sort, but the Lord let me know he would teach me and show me how. I finally stepped out in faith after two years of praying about it. I knew the only way that our biker ministry would be successful would be for the Lord to lead and give guidance on what to do and where to go, and he has. I could have never dreamed that six years ago we would be where we are today. This is not because of me. It is because of Jesus and Him leading us in what to do. Oh, how wonderful His plans are. Today, I'm the president of the Crossroad Riders Motorcycle Ministry. The Lord has us out in the community, and as a group of believers, we are making a difference for the kingdom. Praise the Lord. I am so thankful He used my plot twist in this way. Amen. Amen. If you brought a Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 41. We are... Finishing up uh, chapter 41 today in uh, this series we're calling Plot Twists. You guys be glad to be back in the series. Um, plot Twists, what we're doing so far. We're halfway through this series. Four weeks in, this is week five of this, uh, this journey through the life of Joseph in the Old Testament. Now, if you don't have a Bible, by the way, there should be some in the rows uh, in front of you. Grab one of those or uh, g- grab your smartphone or your tablet. Go to Bible.com and follow along with us there. Um, but we are in Genesis 41 as, as we're continuing the series called Plot Twists. And what we're learning is that God will take all of the crazy things in our lives, all of our story, the things that have been written down in permanent ink in our lives. And since we serve the Redeemer, he has a way of twisting the plot of our story for our good and his glory. He's good at it. He's really good at it way better than you and I ever could, because you're in the middle, all of us right now are in the middle of something that if God told you right now how he could use that, you wouldn't even believe it. You wouldn't even believe it. In fact, there are things that God wants to do in and through your life right now that hasn't even entered your head, and quite frankly, our faith is a little too limited to even dream it up just yet. And God is going to twist the plot of your story and mine for our good because we, we trust Romans eight twenty eight that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and also for his glory, not only our good, but his glory. And, and so that means there's going to be some pain in our lives that God will redeem. That means there's going to be some challenges that we're going to face and some obstacles we're going to come up against that in the moment you may not be able to explain. That's okay. God's got a plan. He's the author, right? He's the author. 
I remember when we moved out here actually from New Mexico to Tennessee, it was quite the transition, both culturally and uh, with the climate. You know, um, I remember culturally, we didn't know exactly what to expect. We knew we were moving into the South, so we thought Southern hospitality, right? Well, if you know anything about Clarksville, somehow they like missed, the, they skipped out on that class, you know? Like they, they, they did it, they played hooky at, at, you know, Southern hospitality class, and they did not graduate with that degree for some reason. So, so that wasn't exactly what we were, we were expecting. I also remember uh, the climate, so different in Tennessee. It's so green and beautiful, and then New Mexico is so not those things, and uh, so brown. I, I, I know people say New Mexico has its own beauty, and, and maybe you could see that. I remember now just flying into New Mexico, thanking God that I live in Tennessee. Um, but, but I remember when we moved out here, it was so different because we went from brown desert to green, lush everything. We just sometimes drive to Nashville just to see how beautiful it is. We love it. And all the way back, all along the, the highway. Um, I remember, you know, we, we went from in New Mexico, it was rocks, and now here we have lush green gardens. And one thing that we discovered in New Mexico, or I'm sorry, in Tennessee, was this green stuff that grows from the ground, like all over the place, sometimes even in the cracks of the sidewalk. And w what was this green substance? It was this mysterious stuff that you guys call, that we call now grass. And we had never, we, we had tried to force this stuff to grow in our yards in New Mexico. In fact, you call a, a yard about as big as this little rectangle, right? And you, and you mow it like this. And then you're done, right? And the, the government will, will, like, regulate how much water you can actually even use on your, on your rectangle, you know, of, of grass. So most people just don't even have grass, and we just have rocks. And out here, there's grass, literally, it's, it, the, the phrase, growing like weeds, it literally grows like a weed. Like, out of the cracks in the, we're driving down the road, and there's grass growing everywhere, you know? It's so unexpected to my New Mexico mine that grew up in the desert. So, so it's growth happening in unexpected places. And I thought, what a story of the gospel, isn't it? Growth happening in unexpected places, through unexpected people, in fact, many times in impossible circumstances. This is what our God does. He is the God of, he's the, he's the redeemer, he's the author, he's the one who does things in an improbable way. You know, think about so many uh, examples of this in scripture, you know, like the prophet Isaiah says, streams in the desert, or Ezekiel, breath to the dry bones, or in the New Testament, a child born to a virgin, or in Clarksville, a church in a shopping center, right? God has this way of producing growth in unexpected ways, in improbable ways, through improbable people, like you and me, and like Joseph. Think about Joseph, 17-year-old dreamer, hated by his brothers, sold, betrayed, enslaved, framed, imprisoned, and would you believe it, by the end of Genesis 41, he is the second most powerful person on the face of the earth. God has a way of producing growth in unexpected places. I've entitled the message today, jot this down, flip the script. Flip the script. Here's what I believe God wants to do in your story, just like he did in Joseph's and in mine. He wants to flip the script. In other words, he wants to flip things upside down, or actually probably more, more accurately, he wants to flip things right side up in your life and, and, and give them, give us a, a new perspective. He wants to flip the script and produce growth where there was deep loss and tragedy in your life. Do you believe that we serve the God who can produce growth where there was loss in your life? Do you believe we serve the God who can redeem the pain in your life? Do you believe we serve, we happen to be worshiping and singing to a God who redeems your pain and gives purpose to your circumstance? Do you believe that? And so this is Joseph. This is Joseph's story, but Joseph's story can be your story if you choose to submit to the same God Joseph served. And we're going to look at how that, how that works today in Genesis chapter 41, starting in verse 37. Here's what it says. This proposal, now, a uh, little backstory. I know it's been a couple weeks. Let me remind you, Joseph was uh, 
put in the house of Potiphar, one of the top officials in Egypt. He was given full control over everything happening in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife lusted after Joseph, tried to seduce him multiple times. Joseph wouldn't have it. She uh, saw her opportunity. The house was empty. Nobody was around. She grabbed him and tried to forcefully have him uh, uh, lay with her. He ran out, leaving his coat behind. She grabbed his coat and framed him for rape. Uh, her husband, it didn't seem like fully believed her, but had to do something, threw him in prison. He spent a couple years in prison where he met two people. And, and don't you know, we don't, our God doesn't deal in, in coincidences. Let's, let's be thankful that there are a lot of times that there will be people in and out of your life that you thought, it just so happened that I ran into that person the other day. But God may have that person in your life for a reason. It certainly was no accident that the baker and the cupbearer of the king of Egypt ended up in prison, the same prison where Joseph was. God gave him the interpretation of his dreams, of their dreams. The interpretations came true. And a couple, and Joseph got forgotten in prison. These guys left. One got executed for his crime. The other one was restored to his position. And two years later, Pharaoh, the top dog, most powerful man on planet Earth at the time, has uh, two dreams. And these dreams are foretelling the future, it turns out. He hears about Joseph. He calls Joseph out of prison. Joseph gives him the interpretations of the dreams. And then Pharaoh goes, what should we do? Joseph says, well, since God, since there's going to be seven years of plenty, and then after that, seven years of drought, you need a man, watch this, you need a man who is discerning and wise to manage all of this stuff. Now, I don't think that Joseph was trying to promote himself. He was simply saying, God has given us the future. You need to make sure that you've got a strong, wise manager of, of the food so that you're prepared for the future. And so Pharaoh goes, well, gee, who should we choose, right? So that's where we pick up verse 37. This proposal to, to find this manager pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Think about that for a moment, by the way. Pagan, pantheistic, Egyptian God ruler saying, I need somebody with the Spirit of God. That's a big deal. Then Pharaoh, verse 39, said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there's none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of of Egypt. God right there is already producing growth in very unexpected places. And then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. That's the thing that would give the authority, the signing power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph now could sign it in Pharaoh's name and it would be done. That's, this is the most powerful thing he could have had. He clothed them in garments of fine linen, it says. He put a gold chain, he's blinging, around his neck, verse 43, and he made him ride in his second chariot. And you know that's no jalopy of a chariot, right? Like he was cruising now. And they called out before him, bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I'm Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath paneah because he wanted to give him a really confusing name to pronounce. And he gave him in marriage Azanath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So if you know the priest of On, it's Potiphar and, and their daughter. No, you don't know that. It's okay. That was a joke. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. So here we have, I, I want to give you, we're going to walk through this text and, and close out with these last few verses here in a minute, but I want to give you today three things that if you will, principles, that if you'll live by these things, God can produce growth. He can produce uh, fruitfulness in the most unexpected places and ways in your life. God wants to flip the script. He wants to turn things right side up and give us his perspective. Let's start with the first thing of three. Number one, the way up is the way down. Let me explain. The way up, if you want to go up, you got to start by going down. Think about Joseph here for a moment. He's, uh, he's literally getting the royal treatment, you know? L literally, 
he, tra- he traded in a shepherd's staff for, for Pharaoh's signet ring now. He, he's traded in his coat of many colors for it says, uh, I believe it's in verse 40, for his, uh, his garments of fine linen. He traded in an iron collar when he was in slavery, for now it says a gold chain around his neck. He traded in, uh, think about the way he rode into Egypt as a slave in a, in a slave caravan, and now it says he was cruising in Pharaoh's second chariot. Okay, this guy was just in prison recently. Now he's cleaned and clothed and shaven. This guy is blinging and rolling and cruising in Pharaoh's chariot. And this, he's now renamed and married. And now this no-name slave that God has smuggled into Egypt is now the second most powerful man on planet Earth. Do you see the redemption that God is able to... Now, now remember, this wasn't a fast process. We, we like the fast track for things, don't we? We don't like the scenic route. God took Joseph on the scenic route. And I want you to know there's a lot you can learn from the scenic route. God will take you on the scenic route to get you exactly where he needs you to be. And it might be pretty painful on the journey. But you just keep your eyes fixed on the God who's with you through it and he's got you. Amen? He's got you. He's with you. And he's got a plan through all the pain. All of this, none of this was a, was a coincidence. None of it was a mistake. God can use all of that. So he's the second most powerful man on planet Earth now. You know, it's interesting. The world will give you lots of ideas about how to get power. Right? Climb the ladder, man. Network. You've got to network. You've got to know some people, man. You've got, got, you got to have some friends in high places. Are you on LinkedIn yet? You know? Like, update your resume already. I mean, get that job promotion. That's going to look really good on your resume. And if you could just network with the right people, and if you could just climb that ladder and build your portfolio, and if you could just do this, and, and then you'll get to power. Then people will notice you. You'll make a name for yourself. People will know who you are. You'll be successful. You know what Jesus says? No, actually, swallow your pride and bow the knee. Humility bowing down, apparently, according to Scripture, is the way up. 1 Peter 5, 6 puts it this way. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, He will exalt you. It doesn't say, humble yourself, but also make sure to build your portfolio. It just says, humble your, swallow your pride. Stop thinking you're all it. Stop thinking you've got this. Bow the knee. Swallow your pride. Humble yourself. The way up is the way down. Humility, kneeling down, is the way up. Verse 38, we read it. It's significant because it's the first mention in the Bible of the Holy Spirit coming upon someone. So take note of it. There's a biblical principle when you're studying the Bible, the law of the first. It's very important the, the first time something is mentioned, and this is very important in Scripture. And it's also significant, not just because it's the first mention, but because of who mentions the Holy Spirit. Pharaoh, pagan, pantheistic God ruler. I say God ruler because Pharaoh was worshipped as God in Egypt. There were hundreds of, of Egyptian gods, which, by the way, it's interesting that our God is the one who's controlling all of the weather throughout the story. It's kind of a slight to all of their weather gods, you know, the sun god and the rain god and the crop god and all of those gods don't seem to really be in that much control, but we happen to serve the God who is. And so here's Joseph now rising to power, and it's this man, this pantheistic pagan ruler who's saying, I need somebody who's spirit-filled. That's a big deal. You know, I think that our, our world, our culture, should be filled with people that whether or not they, they believe the Bible, whether or not they go to church, whether or not they see eye to eye with you on your religious beliefs, they should be like Pharaoh saying, man, I, I may not believe everything that Christian believes, but I need some Christians in my life. I need some spirit-filled people in my life. I want spirit-filled neighbors. I want spirit-filled employees working for me. I want spirit-filled friends in my life. I may not see eye to eye on them, and I may think they're kind of weird with all their Jesus jargon, but man, something's different about those people. 
I think about Joseph here. This is the guy. This is Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the guy that people from all around come to bow down to. And he goes, I need somebody who has the living God inside of him. Talk about being the light in the world, right? How did Joseph get there? Well, remember, over and over, as Pharaoh approached Joseph and said, you can give me the interpretation. You answer me what this dream means. Joseph over and over goes, hey, God's the one who gives the answer. It's not in me. Do you remember his phrase? It's not in me. It's God who gives the answer. Over and over. God is telling you this. God has set the, set the course of these, these actions and these occurrences in your life. And, and so here's the thing. All, all that we need to do, the way up is the way down. You swallow your pride, you bend the knee, you serve other people, and you vocally and repetitively and consistently give God the glory all throughout your life, okay? Let me tell you this. You are never, you never look more like Jesus than when you are humbly serving others to benefit them and to glorify God. The way up is the way down. Humble yourself. Swallow your pride. This is what Joseph teaches us. Verse 46, let's continue. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Again, let me just remind you, if you think it's going to be fast, the dream that God has laid on your heart, it's going to be big, that's for sure, but it may not be fast. It took Joseph 13 years to get to this place. A lot of us would whine after 13 minutes, right? Right? 13 years. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Let's read through the end of the chapter. Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh, and he went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly, and he gathered up all the food of those seven years which occurred in the land of, the Egypt, uh, of Egypt and put the food in the cities. He put in every city the food from the fields around it, and Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea. Until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. That's a lot of food. Take that, Sam's Club, right? Before the year of famine came, Sam's Club, you know it's short for Samples Club, right? Anyway, we go to feed my, we take our, our kids there to feed them lunch sometimes. Verse 50, I'm getting off topic. Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Azanath, the, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name. Now, this is important. These are not just names we're going to blow past. We'll come back to these. Keep them in mind. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. Verse 52, the name of the second he called Ephraim. For God has made me fruitful in the land of of my affliction. How could anything good come from the land of affliction? Well, we serve the God who flips the script, right? He twists the plot of our story for our good and his glory. How can you be fruitful in the land of affliction? We'll come back to that, okay? Verse 53, the seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said, or more accurately, how God had said. There was famine in all lands, but in all land... It, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread because Joseph was a wise manager. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread all over the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe all over the earth. Number two, would you write this down? Here's another principle for us to live by. We want to see God flip the script. Here's what we need to remember. Great faith leads to great work. The Bible puts it this way. Faith without works is dead. You can't say you believe in something if you're not willing to prove it through your actions. Joseph does this, uh, sets a great example of this, because through dreams and interpretations, God has made the future crystal clear to Joseph and Potiphar and, and the Egyptian officials. He's made this very clear. But notice that when it, when, as soon as Joseph was, was uh, given power, he didn't just sit around and bask in his newfound glory and just pray and plan for the future. Those are all good things, praying and planning. You should do that 
all throughout the rest of your life, but he didn't only do that. So a lot of Christians get in the habit of only praying and, and planning, and we don't actually get out and act. Notice that the first thing Joseph did, verse 46, so it says, verse 46, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, and Joseph went out. He left the comforts of his palace. Come on. You'd want to just hang out in the palace. I would, I would love to just take a nap in the palace. I'll bet he had a sweet hammock, you know? Some, some servants. I, you could order anything. Like, talk about room service, and you don't have to pay $25 for a piece of cheesecake. It just comes to you, you know? You get what you want. And Joseph left that because he goes, God told me what was going to happen. I better get to work. See, see here's, this, this is an important uh, principle for us. He got to work because we have to understand that when God tells us the future, it's not a forecast, it's a promise. There's not a 90% chance of maybe this will happen. When God says it's going to happen, he already dwells in the future. It is happening. We've talked about this. God knows the future better than we know the past or the present. He lives there. He's outside of time and space. He's not predicting something that might happen in the future. He's speaking from the future and telling us this is going to happen. See, God is outside of, of what we're trapped inside. So here's what I want you to understand. What we have to learn from Joseph here is that if we truly believe the promises of God, they will produce obedience to God in our lives. You see, faith was never meant to be a substitute for hard work in our lives. Come on, Christians. Let, let's, let's have an honest talk here because a lot of Christians are like, yeah, I, I believe. We're going to like faith it into existence, right? Like God's going to just, yeah, I mean, God's going to, God's going to provide for awakened church. And he's going to let, like one day we're going to drive, drive into the shopping center and there's going to be a whole new building. Really? Like may, maybe God certainly has the, op the, the, the option to do that, but probably how God's going to provide for us is through our hard work. When we partner with him and we give and we sacrifice and we go big, trusting that God's got our back and he's our provider, then that's how God works. See, if, if we believe it, we have to act it out. We have to get to work. Faith was never meant to substitute for all the work. We, we, don't, we don't necessarily like the work, but we're happy to sit on a couch and faith stuff into existence. You know what I mean? This is not how this works. Joseph didn't just sit in the comfort of his palace and just hope that all the grain got stored up. He left the comforts. You got to leave the comfort of your, of your area. You got to step out of what's comfortable and say, I got to get to work. I got to start taking some steps. Think about the nation of Israel coming into the promised land. Do you remember? God told them, I, I want the, the feet of the priest to step into the water. When they get their feet wet, I'll, I'll cut off the water, but not until that. You get your feet wet. Come on, Christians. We got we to gotta get our feet wet. We got to step into the water. Come on, somebody. You got to step into the water. Get your feet wet. Take a step because if you believe it, you got to act on it. Okay? Now, listen. Don't let in. Uh, here's how this works. A lot of times we get a, uh, some good ideas, some great intentions. But an amen in church. Watch this. An amen in church should translate to an obey in your life. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean amen less. That means obey more, all right? Let's just be clear on that. A lot of times we get the idea that, well, yeah, man, I got all these great ideas and I got this cool journal because Awaken, Awaken sell these cool journals. And so I'm going to write down all this stuff. Listen to me. Who cares if it makes it into your journal and it doesn't make it into your life? Right? I got a reminders app on my phone, but it's not so that I can be reminded of all my good intentions. It's so that I can get to work. Right? My, my phone reminds me of it, but it doesn't do the work for me last time I checked. And so we have to, we have to take notes, but then we got to take action. Right? You got to plan the work, but work the plan. You, you, gotta, you can't just write stuff down and have some good ideas. You got to put them into work. So write it down and then work it out in your life. Right? God says, uh, Paul, Paul the Apostle in the book of Philippians, he says, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Now, it's not only up to you, because the very next verse, verse says, it's God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. But you get to work. It's not just God producing all of the things in your life. We partner with God. God is sovereign, but we're responsible. 
Step out, get your feet wet, take, take a step of faith and believe that God is with you. And, and so uh, take notes, but most importantly, take action. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that when God speaks about relationships, you should follow what God has to say about relationships. That means when God's word speaks about finances, you should follow what God's word says about finances. That means when God lets us in on the future, read the book of Revelation, that means you should buckle up because that's exactly what's going to happen. That means when God speaks, we listen and then we act. Great faith leads to hard work. Amen? Come on. Great faith leads to hard work. We can't be just people who hear it and sit there and, and, and watch it happen. No, Joseph got out. He left the comfort. We got to leave our comfort and get out and put it to work. Now, let's go back. I, I introduced you to Joseph's two sons, and this is so important. I think this is like one of the keys of the whole text. If we're talking about flip the script and how God wants to produce growth in our lives, I, I got to see, I, man, I, I had never seen this before as I've read the story of Joseph, but watch this. Verse 51 and 52 were, were I, I think, is kind of a turning point in the story because we're going to learn some really valuable lessons from the, the names of Joseph's sons. According to verse 51, he named his firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship in all my father's house. Now, now listen, he didn't actually forget like you might think. He didn't, it wasn't wiped from his memory. In fact, all throughout the rest of his story, he's going to remember back to, he's going to think about them. He's going to ask questions about his father's household, and he, he, he can't forget the affliction that he's in. Okay, so it's, we'll, we'll come back to that here in a moment, but I want, I want us to understand today that forgetfulness is important for the fruitfulness God wants to bring in our lives. Let me help you understand. Forgetfulness is valuable in our lives. And I know some of us are like, maybe you would consider yourself a professional forgetter. You know what I'm talking about? Like you're, you're just losing, every time you go out the door, you're like, I don't know where my keys are. Where's my phone? It's, you're holding it. Where's my phone? I can't find my phone, right? The other day, I couldn't find the steak seasoning. It was in the refrigerator. I don't know why. I don't know why it ended up there. The other day, I couldn't find the cough medicine. It was, I had put it in the drawer with the spoons. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Is this what happens with age? I don't know. But I'm, I'm starting to forget things. I, I don't know. I can't find my parking space. I did this literally on Friday. Where are we parked? I hit the panic button on the, on the car. You know what I'm talking about? And my daughter's like, what's that horn honking? That's us. That's our car. Now I know where we're parked, right? I forget all the time. Now, now, when we forget things, I want you to know spiritually it can be, it can be key. In fact, I believe forgetfulness is key to, to fruit, fruitfulness in our lives. So if you want to have verse 52, Ephraim, fruitful in the land of your affliction, I want you to know you have to be, verse 51, Manasseh, forgetful in your affliction. Let me explain this to you. Write this down. Here's a key principle. What you are holding on to may be holding you back. What you are holding on to may be holding you back. This is the time where if you don't want to talk about uh, forgiveness, you could excuse yourself because that's where we're going. All right. We're going to, we're about to step on some toes here because what we have to understand is our need to forget so we can move forward. Let's learn from Joseph about this because, again, like I mentioned, I'm not talking about forget like wiped, wiped from your memory. I'm talking about forget as in not held back by any longer. Because think about it. Joseph didn't forget. There are many things in your life that you wish you could forget and you can't. That thing that person said to you. That relationship that you thought would be lifelong and it's ended. It's over. That deep wound that somebody's inflicted on you. And if you wanted to, if you've tried to forget and you can't. I'm not talking about wiping it from your memory. There are many things you can't do that to. But I'm talking about not allowing it to hold you back any longer. In fact, I would say that because he chose to forget his affliction, he was fruitful in his affliction. This is how God produced the Ephraim fruitfulness because he had Manasseh forgetfulness in his life. When we choose to let go of the grudges that we could easily hold on to, 
now we can begin to move forward. Listen to me very closely. Your grudge will be your judge. Your grudge, I can't forget that person. You'll never believe what they said to me. I can't believe how they hurt my family. I can't believe what that I, we didn't deserve, but they shouldn't have said, and your grudge, you're just building on that grudge. Listen, your grudge will be your judge. Your grudge is a gauge of how little you understand God's grace. Do I need to let that settle for a moment? Because I'm preaching to myself here. When I hold on to something, how is God ever going to produce growth in my life when I've got the weeds of bitterness just flourishing in my heart? They're choking out the growth that God wants to bring in my life. Man, there are a hundred things I could list to you that people have done or said to me even just recently that I have to choose to just move forward. That doesn't mean they're right. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm saying it was okay for them to do it. God didn't say it's okay for you to sin, but he chose to forgive you for it. So our, our grudge will be our judge. We have to choose to forgive people because we are forgiven people. Forgiven people forgive people. That's what we do. It's not an option. In other words, if we want God to flip the script, you need to love the unlovable. You need to honor the people around you that are the least deserving. You need to go out of your way to carry somebody's burden. You need to look on, on, on somebody else who is struggling with eyes of compassion like Jesus would have on them. In short, what I'm saying is treat others like God has treated you. Mercy and grace. Thank God he didn't treat me like I deserved. Thank God, come on, can we thank God that he didn't treat you like you deserved? Man, we talk about, well, God's not fair. Thank God he's not fair. He's merciful. Come on, we can clap for that. There we go, Christina, thank you. God is faithful, and, and, and so with the love that we have been given, we have to choose to love other people. Now, again, Joseph didn't forget what his brothers had done, but he moved past it. He allowed God to produce fruit in the land of affliction. This is powerful stuff. Now, I know that if we're going to have God flip the script in our lives, it's going to involve probably like, for some of us, like a complete rewrite of our script, you know? Or at least some editing, some major editing. Like some probably ripping up in half and starting over in places. I, I read actually a recent online article where um, this article was urging teachers to change from using red pens to green pens when grading the student's work. Maybe you've heard of this. So there's this uh, psychologist um, this doctor, he has a bunch of uh, letters behind his name. I don't know what they all stand for. But he said this, on this in this article. He said the psychology behind it is simple. Green is the color of hope, which suggests that there can be room for improvement rather than to make their work bloody with the red pen, which gave a notion that what they did are errors, which can demoralize the student. So then it listed this, uh, this website, Color Psychology. Apparently that's a thing. Green, apparently, is the color of balance, harmony, and growth. So it goes on. This is a color that has a strong sense of right or wrong, inviting good judgment. A color, the color green, inviting good judgment. It sees both sides of the equation, weighs them up, and then usually takes the moral standard in making appropriate decisions. The color green does. The color green does this. Green is also, quote, an emotionally positive color, giving us the ability to love and nurture ourselves. We just need some hugs, right? And others unconditionally. Loving and nurturing ourselves, let's be honest, is what's wrong with America, okay? Don't tell me I'm wrong. That hurts. Just give me a high five. I just need a hug. I just need some encouragement. Could you hand me a lollipop? Because that's what I really need. I don't need you to grade it with red pen. Come on, that might, that might tell the students that 
what they did was an error. We couldn't, like, that could demoralize them. What if little Johnny went home like, I made a mistake. What if he, what if he did that? That would be terrible. We've got to use a green pen. It's the color of hope. Guys, this is, this is like a commentary on our culture. Sometimes the most valuable information we can hear is when somebody in love says, what I see in your life is wrong and I want to help you through it. And so what we often need to do, a lot of times we get what you might call the, the script of your life. And we're like, Jesus, I, wanna, I want you to flip the script, but could you use a nice color on it, please? Because, like, I just need some encouragement in my life, and I just don't know if I can handle the harshness of the red. And, and Jesus goes, actually, the red's good for you. Let me, yeah, this is wrong. You spelled this wrong, and that's an error. I'm just going to cross that out. And, and this whole paragraph, really, like, that needs to be taken out. And actually, the paragraph there is, I'm going to move it here, because I've got 13 years for you before you get to this place of power. And, and I want you to, before you get to a place where your pride could swallow you, I need you to swallow your pride. So I'm going to help you humble yourself here. I've got something. And so by the time you, you give it to him, it's all marked up. Listen, Jesus isn't out to just encourage us, okay? We need some encouragement. I'm not anti-encouragement, okay? This isn't a, a discouragement pro message. What I'm here to say, though, is that a lot of times the most valuable thing we, we can hear is that we've made some errors and God is here to help us fix it, okay? Here's the great thing. God doesn't mark up the script of our life with red and say, here, fix it. He goes, man, this is all wrong. I'm the answer. Maybe, maybe you didn't hear me. He said, this is all wrong. I'm the answer. Jesus, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? So sometimes Jesus is going to literally have to flip the script by ripping it up a little bit. But it's cool because God has a way of mending it all. See, he takes all the, the brokenness. He takes the humiliation. He takes the questions, my, my marriage failed, he, he, I, I, I didn't know, I was arrested, I was an alcoholic, I didn't have everything together, I, I needed healing, there were open wounds, I lived a hypocritical life, and God says, that's the error, but I'm the answer, let me fix it, let me flip the script, I'll, I'll produce growth in your life from the land of affliction, right? But if you're going to get fruitfulness, listen, you need forgetfulness, you can't be held back by your alcoholism and any longer. You can't be held back by your shame. You can't be held back by your humility or, or your, your humiliation any longer. The guilt that Satan wants to just ruin your life with. Your marriage failed, but God is not a failure and he has not failed you. Whatever you're in, listen, he can produce growth from a failed marriage. He can produce growth from, from alcoholism. He can produce growth from a porn addiction. He can produce growth from rape. He can produce growth from abortion. He can produce growth from the worst places of affliction in our lives. If we would have that Ephraim, that, that Manasseh forgetfulness in our lives so that God can produce the Ephraim fruitful in our land of affliction. You believe that? Joseph is a slave, and yet now he's the second most powerful man on planet earth. Humble yourself in the sight of God, and when the time's right, he will lift you up. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Kevin Miller Podcast. It would mean so much if you would rate this podcast on the platform where you watch or listen. That will help us reach more people with the good news of the gospel. As always, find out more at kevmill.com or follow on Instagram or Facebook.